Okay, so our next keynote speaker is Jose Jimenez Bernie, aka Bernie. And uh, where are you? Yeah. Okay, so brief introduction. So Bernie's a research scientist at CSIRO, CSIRO in uh, agricultural food in Australia, where he leads the research team translational phenomics and services at the high resolution plant phenomics center and before that he was in the marine and atmospheric research center also at CSIRO and originally graduating from the University of Cordova in Spain. So he's basically using a combination of uh, remote and proximal sensing tools such as hyperspectral and thermal imaging chlorophyll fluorescence and laser scanning for the non-invasive monitoring of, of crop physiology on large populations in the field. So, uh, Bernie, please come and teach us about this. Well, now I will scare with the video, so hopefully it plays this time. Uh, but anyway, we do our best. Uh, yeah, for me, it's a great honor to be here today in CIMIC. Uh, um, I have the opportunity to talk about some of the work we're doing in Canberra. And I guess, um, um, especially talking about field phenotyping, which seems to be a high uh, uh, topic in the new survey, and especially how we apply that to crops such as cereals. So I guess for most of you, this, uh, you are many, uh, you're very familiar with this type of environment, this type of field uh, experiments that are grown all over the world, like uh, probably there's thousands of these all around where people are performing phenotyping. Um, it's great to be here in CIMIT where a lot of the measurements in phenotyping were uh, that drove the green revolution were relatively basic, like you just need like a ruler, um, steak knife to get biomass cuts and obviously the deal at the end. So the question uh, I made myself when I started working in this field is, uh, can we replace these really basic tools such as the ruler or steak knife with lasers or some like uh, more 21st century technologies. Um, unfortunately, the, the technology is not going to be like this. So the lasers and robots that we can apply are not going to be really um, like a science fiction kind of thing. They're going to be more likely something like this that I've been talking about today and presenting. So it's not that exciting at all, but I think that the results that are coming from this are quite exciting. So I come to this a little bit later. Um, so I work in what is called the ha Australian Plant Phenomics Facility, uh, um, and that facility has two nodes. It's a, uh, it's a national facility in Australia, which means that it's open to any researcher in Australia, but also to anyone in the world. Uh, and there's two main facilities, one based in Adelaide, which uh, Bettina and Trevor uh, and Heli are managing, and then there's another facility in Canberra where I work in, and Savi is the director who is sitting there. Um, and really the aim of this facility is to provide infrastructure for the community all across the scale from the control plants to the uh, environment. So the type of work we do is what we call phenomics from the pot to the farm, really working with single plants, mother plants, and the control environment using uh, either commercial or home developed technologies, um, such as the plant scan that you see in this picture that we developed in Canberra, then we can move to the next level up using some technologies for phenotyping in mini canopies in control environment, like in the glass house. Um, but really, most of the work uh, I've been driving uh, in Canberra with my colleagues is how to apply some of these technology in field trials, how to apply that either to a small or relatively small field trials up to the large scale, uh, kind of commercial scale, phenotyping, and even how to take some of this technology to the farm scale as well. Um, so we use, uh, we have developed and we use a, an ecosystem of different phenotyping platforms that we deploy under all these different conditions. And like Matthew said, we use a range of technologies that I will be showing today. So something that is also really important to, to consider is uh, all the work we do in phenotyping is all based in this equation of uh, the interaction between the genotype and the environment and in the case of farming system, the management as well. But you have to keep in mind that these phenotypes are dynamic and some of them are really uh, highly dynamic. Like for example, 
if we're looking into water use and canopy temperature as a surrogate for water use, that will change within seconds. So you need to consider that either because um, you need to capture that interaction between the genotype and the environment, but you can also use that to uh, your advantage because it means that you can, if you monitor um, uh, with high temporal resolution, you can then resolve the interactions of these genotypes and the environment, um, and, and that's quite, kind of what we're aiming to. So I'd like to also highlight the importance of uh, the calibration and not just getting pretty pictures, and I guess we see a lot of talks about the use of UAVs uh, and some technologies. And for me, it doesn't really matter what platform we use. We can use ground platforms, we can use area platforms, it can be men, a men, or even a pigeon. At the end of the day, the key thing is how to go from these pictures, uh, these images that we collect, which are basic pretty pictures, into actual physical values, such as temperature in this case. And uh, there's a, a, a range of knowledge and technologies and engineering problems that we need to resolve, such as the uh, acquisition software to make sure the quality of the data that we capture is good enough, but also all the radiometric calibrations and, uh, and different steps to get down to these physical values. But then this, the, the next challenge is really how do we extract these values? How do we um, go from these physical values to the experiment layout to our genotypes to our treatments, and, and we have put a lot of effort into that, developing our tools, uh, because most of the times these solutions are not commercially uh, available these days. So uh, just to start with, uh, so anyway, so we use, uh, um, we use drones, but we also use full-size helicopters, and the reason for that is that the scale at, at what, what we work, which is thousands of plots, thousands of genotypes. We need to be able to cover that technology. Within, we, we need to be able to cover this experiment within seconds, and that's why we use full-size helicopters to be able to achieve that. And, and, the, and the good thing with this is that we went from, like, uh, heritabilities from uh, handheld canopy temperature measurements of about 0.1 to heritabilities about 0.6, just by capturing the whole experiment within a few minutes and eliminating all, all that um, environmental noise. The good thing is also because we use these uh, full-size helicopters, we can cover the entire uh, experiment, not just with one camera, but we can fly three different cameras or, or more. So we fly Therma, we fly RGB, and we have, uh, so we can fly a very high resolution RGB camera, which allows us to create 3D reconstructions of the whole uh, field experiment and be able to extract uh, parameters such as canopy temperature or even some basic uh, architectural parameters out of that, which allows us to correct for some of the effects in the canopy temperature measurements as well. We also started flying some of the um, new multispectral cameras that are available right now in the market, which allows us to not just use NDVI, but extract all the spectral indexes that correlate much better with chemical composition such as chlorophyll content, and um, potentially because we, we can carry that weight, we could fly hyperspectra um, or any other multispectral technology that will give, uh, will give us a better insight about the photosynthetic status of all the different plots. But um, as our previous speaker mentioned before, it's really important the, to understand the dynamics and to understand the, uh, um, uh, for me, it's the combination of the spatial information that we can get from these area platforms together with the uh, high temporal resolution that we can get from the uh, sensor networks, for example. So we have been developing different sensor networks. In this case, what I'm showing here is, is what we call the Ardu crops. It's an infrared thermometer that measures the temperature continuously. So we get a measurement every second, average every minute or five minutes. And what they give us is the, the Re, the interaction between the, uh, the canopy temperature as a surrogate of water use and the, um, uh, uh, and the environment. So, and this is really important, and the reason why I like this picture here is because um, obviously it would be great to fly a drone or a helicopter every day to, to get these dynamics as well, but normally we cannot get that. So the problem is that if we, uh, this shows like three different genotypes selected for different reasons, like low temperature for high transpiration rates, 
high temperature uh, selected by carbon isotope discrimination and a um, commercial variety. Uh, what we see here is that with the three different colors, if, if we flew our sensor one day or another day, we would get completely different results. So for example, if we fly this day here just after a rain event, we can see the ranking of our hot and cold genotypes will be very different than if we fly this day where uh, the crop has gone to some water stress and it's probably struggling to get all the water through the crop. So it's really important to combine this spatial and temporal information to get a clear picture of, of this uh, genotype and environment interactions. But if I have to pick what is the next big thing in terms of sensors for phenotyping, for me, it would definitely be the LIDAR. So the LIDAR is a laser scanning system which uh, what creates is a it measure the distance from the sensor to the crop. And what the LIDAR gives us is a, a, a full 3D reconstruction of a crop that then we can use to analyze that in many different ways. So we can extract basic things such as canopy height, but also we can get much uh, a very good estimation of what uh, canopy volume and therefore use that as a surrogate for biomass or even more complex traits uh, that I will show in a minute. So what we did is integrate that LIDAR system uh, first into a much bigger platform, but then we end up developing this you see in the video. So this is obviously just a model of that. So this is a model of that phenomobile that you see in this video. And the reason why we developed this device is that we wanted to make something really portable, modular, cost-effective, so we could make many of these and operate that in different environments. Um, and we uh, did it in a way that would be modular to integrate other sensors apart from the LiDAR. So the standard version of this, we normally operate uh, green seek as a way to measure NDVI because that's kind of the de facto standard for many people right now. But, but also we operate a, a high resolution camera for doing some visual assessment. So the, I think we really did well making something that was portable and easy to operate. Uh, and then it can be run both in controlled environments such as a glass house or polytunnel in this case, and field experiments and apply that to different experiments. And a big motivation for that is that we really need to uh, apply this uh, kind of uh, uh, seamless uh, phenotyping technologies across multiple environments. So we work a lot, and Greg will present a lot of some of this work later on in his presentation on what we call the managed environment facility, which is pretty much a, it's a collection of experiments at the different uh, ge uh, geographical locations, but also with ir different uh, levels of irrigation to target different environments. Um, so we need to apply the same phenotyping technology across these environments uh, and, and across these uh, locations. But also the problem is that even within each location, we may have four or five or more experiments in different locations in the farm. So we need something that we can put in the back of the trailer, transport it, and being able to measure a few thousands of plots uh, pretty quickly. So for the last few years, oops, we've been um, uh, developing different calibration and validations for some of the traits that we can extract from the LIDAR. So a very simple one, obviously, is canopy height. It's the, the same thing that we measure with the ruler. Uh, so we went there and measured the ruler, uh, the height with the ruler, and then compared with the estimates of height that developed from the LIDAR. And obviously, we got pretty good results. Uh, and what we found is that the error bars of the LIDAR when we aggregate by genotype are much smaller than the error bars that we get for the manual measurements. Uh, taking into account that we eliminate, eliminate the human factors. Where's the, the top of your canopy? If you take different uses, they're going to get different views and different approaches. The other advantage of this system is because it's really easy to operate and really easy to move around. We can operate that on, on a high temporal basis. So we can operate this weekly, twice a week. We could operate every day if we wanted to. And then start getting some of the dynamics and things like growth rates for the different genotypes. And that graph on the right-hand side represents the evolution of different um, genotypes of a, a mutant population and how the evolution of growth is uh, very different and how they end up um, getting different heights uh, that we can monitor with the LIDAR and go from height on different time points into growth rates. But probably the most exciting results come from the estimation of digital biomass based on the LIDAR. So first of all, you need to keep in mind that the LIDAR gives us a, a volumetric estimation of the canopy. It's not actual biomass. So 
what we're really measuring is uh, bio volume. So obviously, this needs to be corrected by other factors such as the development stage or the canopy density, uh, specifically fairy and things like that. But still, uh, in the experiment that we ran last year, where we had uh, biomass cuts for validation combined with the LIDAR at different uh, developmental stages, we found that we could get a pretty good estimation of uh, the biomass, the digital biomass versus the destructive. So we have developed two different algorithms for the estimation of biomass because what we found is that after a head emergence, obviously uh, all the remobilization will happen from the leaves and the stems to the grain, and the, um, the algorithm we won't pick that up, but by combining information from all the sensors, including hyperspectra, then we are able to combine that and get much better estimation for biomass, e even POTS and, and thesis. Um, and obviously, because it's a 3D image, then we can extract the image and segment the image in a different way that you do with a 2D image. And, and the beauty of that is that then we can start looking at things like uh, extracting the heads, start, start extracting the spikes, and potentially quantifying how many spikes we have and even some volumetric estimates of these uh, uh, um, spikes. So uh, our dream really is go to something like a digital harvest index that prevent the whole thing of uh, doing all this destructive sampling in the, uh, in the field. But we are also working on some uh, novel traits that they are very difficult to measure uh, because uh, it requires uh, equipment or they are very time consuming. And a good example of that are some of more complex uh, canopy traits that uh, give us information about the canopy architecture, the leaf angle, or even how the light is distributed inside the canopy. So for example, by um, analyzing the LIDAR point cloud in a different way, we can see how each of these little graphs is a single genotype. And we can see how different they look like. This is kind of a, a, a profile projection of, of, of uh, like a transversal projection of this uh, plot. So you can see the differences in height. You can see the differences in architecture, how, so how some of them are more erect than others, uh, how they uh, allow the light to penetrate further into the canopy. But also using the information about the, the laser reflectance, so we use a red laser in this case, then we are able to see how much red light is reflected back from the canopy, which is a really good indicator of the greenness of the canopy, how much chlorophyll is still uh, functional in that canopy. So, so we can use that to model the light interaction in the canopy and also where the light has been used. So by, again, reanalyzing that point cloud in a different way, we can create these profiles, which give us an indication of the leaf area density in the vertical profile of the canopy and how green the canopy is still in that uh, level of the canopy. So uh, what we're aiming right now is to really model the light penetration and compare that with measurements with septometers and, um, um, and light sensors. So again, by using the multi-temporal dimension of this data and going there and running this every week, then we are able to map the evolution of uh, the canopy architecture over time and using uh, some uh, the right genetic material developed by Greg Rubeski in this case, we are able to characterize some of these um, near estrogenic lines that differ just on these uh, architecture parameters and follow the evolution uh, around the senescence uh, for this. So we can compare that with other measurements such as leaf area index, um, uh, fractional cover, and so on, and look how these different genotypes are evolving very differently um, for example, when we have irrigation or we don't have irrigation. So we can see, for in this case, these are two near isogenic lines for presence or absence of ligules and how uh, the, the senescent profile, the onset of the senescence is different for the two different uh, genotypes, but also for the two different environments, in this case, irrigated and rain-fed. But the other uh, important thing that we're trying to address right now is obviously uh, these things that we have developed work uh, great at the plot level, but the question is uh, uh, breeders are not interested so much in the plot scale because uh, the feedback that we get is that, well, we're going to harvest that anyhow if we get to that point. So how can we bring this earlier in the, in the breeding process, in the breeding pipeline, um, so we can look into single plants uh, or we can look at single row uh, treatments? And obviously, 
Breeders don't want to do any destructive sampling on that. They want to get something that is non-destructive because obviously you want to keep these seeds if there's something interesting. So we've been looking into how to extract single rows and apply the same algorithms that we apply to the full crop to this single row. And Greg will be presenting some of that uh, tomorrow. So obviously a lot of the issues that we had during the development of all these uh, 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 ecosystem of tools is how to harness all the information that comes from all these sensors, all these massive amounts of information that uh, we collect in the field because, yeah, the, the technology oops, uh, is, uh, uh, oops, yeah, um, the technology, uh, I mean, gives a lot of uh, megabytes and terabytes of data, but also we run that very frequently. So we developed this thing called PhenoSmart, which is it's a cloud-based solution that aggregates all the information that comes from all our different platforms, both in the control environment but also in the field. So the idea with PhenoSmart is to provide a cloud-based uh, solution that can be deployed in any cloud infrastructure, either commercially available or on-site supercomputer facilities that most of us have available, um, and how to deploy that as a virtual machine that people can upload the data. And the goal with that is um, to provide all these algorithms that we have developed for the use of the technologies that we have developed or use that with third parties as well. Um, so we are in the process of um, uh, partnering with different uh, commercial companies to be able to deploy this uh, uh, for public access to, uh, to different groups. And in terms of the roadmap for the different traits that we have been extracting, so right now we have been validating and getting good results that we are in the process of publishing of some of the traits that we can extract from the LIDAR, such as ground cover, height, biomass, but also uh, for traits such as canopy temperature. There was a paper just published recently on some of this pipeline. Spike temperature, growth rates, uh, some of this state grain profile that just show right now, and how to combine all that information with all the sources of information such as the canopy temperature and the BI and so on. And that's again something that FenoSmart can provide is that the key thing is how to have all that information in a one-stop shop so we can uh, then query, okay, I have a higher temperature in this genotype, is that because there's a difference in the ground cover for this particular plot? Are there any differences in height? Are there any difference in any manual measurement? Um, and then we're in the process of validating new uh, traits such as state green index combining some of this information, um, spike volume account to potentially go to harvest index. We're looking really hard into how to improve photosynthetic capacity traits non-destructively um, and avoiding doing like or in the field as well using combination of happy spectra, LIDAR and so on. Um, so yeah, there's a, a, a lot of under development right now that hopefully we'll be reporting pretty soon. So this is just an example of how the processing pipeline looks like in this FenoSmart platform where you uh, upload the data from the sensors and then you go to a web-based system where you analyze the data and extract your information. So this is a, a quick look of some of the data from the LIDAR in the field. And eventually the key thing, the key, what most of the people is interested in is getting this table as a CSV file that then you can link to your experimental design and apply your statistic analysis uh, as you would normally do with any other manual measurements. The other key thing of this Phenomobile uh, light system is that it's really modular, which allows us to integrate all the type of sensors, such as uh, canopy temperature, like a thermal camera, which give us really good information about single plant, single organ temperature, and that's how we can extract some of the spike temperature, or we can do a much better job extracting and separating the, the vegetation temperature from the background temperature from the soil, and things like that. Or if we go to single plant, single row uh, phenotyping, that's what gives us this type of information. We also have a hyperspectral system on that one, which uh, gives us like a, a centimeter resolution pixel of, of almost millimeters with three, four, uh, 340 bands, um, which is really useful for some of these uh, photosynthetic trait uh, uh, extraction of even chemical composition. Um, the problem with the happy spectra, as uh, some of you may be experiencing if you have one of these, is how to deal with the massive amount of information that we collect from that. Just to give you an idea, this system, uh, which is just a single camera, gives us one gigabyte per minute. So just to move around the data, just to process that data is a big challenge. So what we're trying to do is put in place some 
mechanisms to reduce the data throughput and just simplify the information that we get from the field, so to make that data more accessible to everyone. But I guess there's a lot of uh, as well going on into how to bring phenomics beyond just phenotyping in breeding trials. And a lot of what we're doing right now is how to export or translate some of this technology to other crops. So we develop a version of this phenomobile that is applicable to grapevines. And instead of scanning from the top, we scan from the side. We give us a really good 3D model of the canopies that then we can apply for the management of uh, <laughs> pruning uh, strategies and, and decision support in, in grapevine industry. Um, we're looking into canola. We've been uh, looking into targeting weeds as well, using LIDAR as a way to map uh, weeds in a much better way that you can do with uh, all the sensors currently available. And then we have even tried LIDAR from the air as a way to see the detail of the information and apply that at a much bigger scale. And obviously, the same methodologies that we apply to start the temperature, for example, at the crop level, to start the reflectance at the crop level, we can apply that to start at the full, uh, like a single tree level in a tree orchard, um, or, you know, or, or segment that in a, every square meter of a farm, uh, with the problem of the scale, obviously. So I'd like to finish acknowledging uh, all the people involved that this is not, this is the result of a big team of a multidisciplinary team at the high resolution plant phenomics in Canberra uh, that has people from different disciplines like mechatronic engineers, software engineers, uh, plant scientists and so on. Um, and all the collaborators in Cicero and outside Cicero as well. And obviously I'd like to acknowledge our um, Jedi master, uh, Bob Farman, who kind of started this thing and, and took us to the, uh, to the right side of the force as well. So may the force be with you. So thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Maina Sara, a biotech stress phenotyping spe specialist with CEMIT. Uh, thank you, Jose, for a very nice presentation. I have two quick questions. The first one is regarding the phenomobile. Yep. Um, how, how is the data quality affected by the, the speed of operation? Yep. If I'm an operator, if I'm moving the, the, the platform uh, a different speed, how is the data quality affected? Yep. The second one is regarding the LiDAR system. Um, I guess the, the precision is high when you have large plots. What, what, um, uh, what do you expect when you move to very small plots, like one row or two row, in terms of precision? Yep. All right, I'll start with the first one. So obviously the LiDAR uh, is influenced by the speed because it's a line scanner, the image or the information is created as you move. So uh, we uh, have pretty accurate measurement of the speed based on the GPS, wheel and colors and all the technologies that we use. Uh, but so that correct for that. So the only limitation, if you were like, normally we use this at uh, walking speed, like uh, f uh, four to six kilometers per hour. And that's normally we get this type of resolution of two to, to five millimeters uh, per uh, resolution, spatial resolution at the plot level. Um, so uh, if you were to move much faster, then you will decrease your longitudinal you know, resolution. But normally it's not a problem. So the system takes into account your speed. So if you move faster, if you stop, or you keep going, that's not that doesn't affect the quality of the like that. In terms of the resolution, uh, how that we, we translate to plots, uh, that's the process we're doing right now, is transla uh, extracting the information from um, full plots to single rows. And what we see is because we achieve, I mean, this is a, this is a LiDAR image. This is, this is kind of the resolution we get. We get two to five millimeters resolution. So definitely it's not a problem. Uh, if we go to smaller plots and even if we have heat plots and things like that, the LiDAR will still give you pretty, pretty high accuracy information. 
Uh, thank you, Bernie, for a very interesting presentation. My, my name is uh, Roberto Quiroz from the International Potato Center. I wonder if you have tried uh, 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 developing a, la a lighter using blue LEDs instead of a laser. Uh, if it, would it be possible to have the same traits that you're measuring with this? The reason I'm asking is because we're using that for measuring chlorophyll fluorescence, uh, that's six meters, and I wonder if it can be used for other traits. Yeah. So at this stage, the light that we're using is just a commercial lighter system that is uh, used for industrial applications that we repurpose for this application. So uh, definitely uh, my dream would be to have a, a multi-spectral lighter with different wavelengths uh, and be able to capture the 3D information. And I know Phenoxpex is working on some of these technologies as well. So there's no reason why you couldn't use any other color uh, or wavelengths that will give you a specific information. So some of the traits, obviously some of the architectural traits, it doesn't matter which color you use, you can even use infrared. Um, the issue, if you want to use this for monitoring uh, chlorophyll, for example, as we're trying to do, then you need something that is like red in, in the visible range that uh, really um, you know, give you that information. It would be great to use some of the blue information, uh, green information, so some of the uh, um, photochemical indexes that are available. So yeah, definitely that could be, uh, I mean, I hope someone from the industry can take some of these um, ideas and, and develop sensors that then we can start using for doing our own science. So yeah, definitely it's a good question. Okay, we have time for one more question. Hola, Jose. Great Hola. to see you again. Um, I'm Argela Lawrence. I work at Arkansas State University. I wanted to ask you about PhenoSmart. Yep. How soon do you think it's going to be available? Well, it's obviously a <laughs> work in progress. Uh, there's a lot of available in terms of the algorithms and, uh, and, and the different pipelines. So a lot of the effort right now is, is kind of rebranding or m moving um, or yeah, these, these existing technologies that we have into that si uh, single uh, portal uh, idea. So we're hoping that that will be available r pretty soon, like uh, sometime next year, we'll have some beta launch, hopefully that we can invite some people to start testing and, and trying the system before we can make it uh, publicly available. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you.